Hey guys, this is Matt from the Skeptic Squared podcast. I'm just letting you know that you're about to listen to an episode of the show recorded before we chose the name Skeptic Squared, and our contact information is different from what you will hear during this recording. If you would like to contact us, you can email us at skepticsquaredpodcast at gmail.com. You can also visit the show's blog at www.skepticsquaredpodcast.blogspot.com. As always, if you like what you hear, please rate us and leave a review. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. This is the Circle Squared Podcast. A safe place to make light of sacred things. My name is Matt. And I'm Corinne. And in this program, we will be discussing current events related to religion, atheism, and skepticism. Our goal is not to insult believers, although that will probably happen from time to time, but rather to share our point of view on these topics in a way which will benefit and entertain others. Or maybe we just want to stroke our own egos. You decide. Hello and welcome to the Circle Squared Podcast. Today is Saturday, November 21st, 2015, and with me is my lovely wife, Corinne. Hello. <laughs> you have to come up with a new thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us once again is my sister, Megan. Hello. <laughs> Today we will be discussing uh, some topics from last week. We have some updates. We also have some mormon themed coffee to talk about which is a little fun since mormons don't drink coffee and some trouble in india that happened a couple weeks ago and we also will be doing an interview of megan getting her story about um you know leaving mormonism and talking about some of the issues that she's had with religion um if you would like to contact us you can email us at circle squared podcast at gmail.com And you can also view the show's blog at www.circlesquaredpodcast.blogspot.com and leave a comment there. If you like what you hear, please rate us and leave a a review on whatever platform you find us. Okay, so let's start with some of the updates. So last week we talked about a a lesbian couple from Price, Utah, which is a a small town, smallish town in central Utah, very Mormon community and they had a couple kids of their own and they had a foster kid um, under a year old I think right nine months. nine months old and they were going through the process with the biological mother to officially adopt the child and they took it to a judge for approval and the judge um, decided that it would be in the best interest of the child if it was not raised by two lesbians it would it would be better off in a heterosexual household and he was basing this he said he was basing it off of research although i i couldn't find anywhere where he actually talked about what research he was referring to and then the article that we talked about last week said that he um, was going to put a stay on it because of the backlash that he was getting from lots of different politicians Um, there was kind of a social outcry and this was in the wake of all the stuff going on with uh, children of gay kids in the Mormon church from their recent announcement that it has led to um, a couple thousand people resigning from the Mormon church within the last couple weeks. Well, the update that we have is that the judge has essentially um, backed out entirely. He has, he has set a date for, I think it was December 4th, um, to do a hearing uh, to you know go over the best interests of the child and then he just walked away <laughs> and gave it to a different judge yeah so he essentially yeah he just gave it to a different judge so that's fun uh to me that sounds like he's kind of washing his hands of it and this probably won't stick um i, I can't possibly imagine the next judge coming in and like reaffirming any of the stuff that he said right not after all the crap the other guy got right <laughs> so, so that's fun <laughs> The other thing that we have, um, so uh, in, in, you know, the, again, the wake of all of the stuff that's been going on with Mormons and homophobia, and especially directed at uh, children being baptized, um, 
this has raised a lot of questions for a lot of true believing Mormons. And um, the Salt Lake Tribune um, recently came out with an article. Um, we're not going to read it because, I mean, we've been kind of talking about this a lot. So this is more just kind of a cap. You can go look it up if you want. It's from the Salt Lake Tribune. And the question is, um, in June, when the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage nationwide, um, one of the apostles, one of the top leaders of the church, came out with a, with, an, with a statement saying that members who support gay marriage online, like in social media, that come out and say that they support the Supreme Court's ruling, will not receive any sort of, you know, disciplinary action. They won't be, um, you know, under duress from the church. They won't have to, like, you know, resign or anything. Um, still be able to go to the temple. Still be able to go to the temple. Um, like this won't affect their official membership with the church. Um, and the question is, uh, how is that going to affect or is this going to change now that um, kids of gay couples have to essentially denounce gay marriage um, in order to be baptized in the, into the church? That's one of the per, uh, parameters that the church set forth in their new handbook was that once they turn 18, they can uh, decide to get baptized only after they disavow the practice of same-sex marriage. So, question up in the air. Um, not a whole lot that I want to really talk about it. Does anybody have any comments on it? No. Yeah. Again, this is this is just kind of a dead horse. We've been beating it to death. Okay, so that's it for updates. Um, so, Megan, how you doing? Good. Good? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Let's kind of just go with uh, some real basic questions. Uh, a lot of the stuff, of course, is similar to my situation since we're siblings. Mm -hmm. um, I start with where are you from? What's your family dynamics? <laughs> <laughs> so just like Matt, I'm from Seattle. Um, so Matt is child number four, and I am child number six. So we're we have five years between us. I'm five years younger than him. Mm -hmm. But we were both raised in the same big Mormon family. <laughs> yep. It's big. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I mean, how much of our family would you say are active members of the church? Um, in our immediate family, I would say everyone except for the two of us. Um, we had have one sibling, our oldest brother, who was kind of going in and out of being inactive. But I think that... I don't know, I haven't really talked to him personally about all of the reasons of what was going on in that situation, but I think it had a lot to do with his divorce and not with him not believing in the church anymore. That, yeah, that's kind of the impression that I got. I, I've kind of avoided asking mm -hmm. um, Parker directly. Um, it just seemed like it was too sensitive of a, of a topic. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to push anything. Um, so I just kind of got bits and pieces from mom. And of course, mom wants to you know be, yeah uh -huh. she, she doesn't want to say anything bad about anything that's going on in anybody's lives she doesn't want to be a gossip which mm -hmm. i understand that's totally fine um and kind of unusual for a mormon wife kind of but uh <laughs> i suppose yeah <laughs> in my experience in relief society <laughs> oh really yeah um so so for me like a lot of it just kind of went unsaid like mm -hmm. I, I really don't know his position i do know that i mean i, I mentioned this in my in, in the first episode where we were talking about all this stuff, he has recently started doing his book again. So that kind of tells me that he's getting back into it. But His missionary book? Right. Yeah. Which I think would be a fun segment to do. Is he just updating it, or what is he doing? Um, I think he did an update and then did a, a republishing of it. Oh, okay. So he's, like, kind of promoting it again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Anyway. So that's for immediate family. Mm -hmm. So, But uh, what about extended family? Extended family, well, our family is so big that it's hard for me to really make a huge generalization because I don't really know every everybody. But I would say, especially on dad's side of the family, I don't really think there are that many cousins or anyone who's left the church. On mom's side of the family, there's probably a bit more, but that fam side of the family is also bigger. Mm -hmm. um, I Yeah, we do have a couple... Um, uh, cousins and I think maybe an aunt or an uncle or two um, that are inactive. I can only think of one actual family on my on mom's side mm -hmm. um, that has officially left the church. Who's that? Clifton. Oh. Okay. Um, 
know. Which, if I remember his Isn't story he correctly, now? right? Yeah, he he, he left <laughs> Mormonism his, for Judaism. I knew his wife was Jewish. I didn't really know his positions. Uh, my understanding is that he joined yeah. uh, the Jewish Church. One of like, I don't know which sect of it. Uh, he seems to be pretty progressive generally. Uh-huh. Um, he's kind of a, a light-hearted old coot. <laughs> <laughs> It's a fun guy to talk to. <laughs> um, anyway, so being raised Mormon, mm-hmm. um, you went through all, like, all of the programs of the church, all uh-huh. the young young woman stuff, girls camps. Did you do personal progress? I did. Oh. Did you make it all the way through? <laughs> you made it all the way through? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah? Can you, I mean, kind of describe Our, what personal progress is. I don't oh, know man. if we've talked about that. I've like kind of forgotten about that (laughs) it's been so long but it's basically I think it's part of the young women program where they give you like this book with different goals and things and like Mm. I think there's like different topics and you can pick a few different goals from for each topic and you need to fulfill a certain amount of things in order to receive um the award yeah. Right, so which is a necklace. necklace. They try and compare it to a guy's Eagle Scout. That was that's their, what I was about to say. Yeah, their uh, compromise for the girls' program, and it's nothing like it. Nothing like it. Right. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I refused to finish my. Right, so, so while boys while boys are running out doing camping, high adventure stuff, going on hikes, canoeing trips, all that kind of stuff. We were sitting at home reading our scriptures and exactly. checking off boxes. And writing right. in our journals and talking to our mothers about what it's like to be a mother. Which, which to me is, is kind of funny because guys are the ones that they send out on missions. Yep. Oh. When the girls are the ones who do the... All the, the studying. All the studying. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought about that, but that's true. So you made it all the way through yeah. the program. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, and then after high school, what did you do? After high school, what did I do? Mm-hmm. Um, like as far as the, the church program, like I went to BYU. Mm-hmm. Um, just you know, taking the religious courses at BYU, going to church every Sunday, but they didn't really have a program similar to um, what's it called again? I can't even remember what it's called. Personal I don't progress. personal progress, personal progress. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, like for an adult. Yeah. Uh, what What did you think of the religion courses at BYU? Um, they were interesting. <laughs> they anything like seminary? They were a lot like like seminary. I do know that like they had a different, a, a few different things. Like seminary focused just on the scriptures. Like we would do a unit on Book of Mormon, unit on the the Bible, and then well there were four different units for the four years of high school. But mm-hmm. I remember taking um, some religious classes at BYU. There were things like world religion or mm-hmm. proclamation to the fam- family, things like that. Oh, um, that was a class? <laughs> that was a class oh, that I oh took. My oh, God. That, that, that reminds me. Uh, one of the articles that I thought about pulling up for this episode, but I, I didn't, um, BYU-Idaho, which is the more conservative version of BYU, um, <laughs> They are changing their course requirements and requiring every single person, like in the, like the next year or so, like new uh, students, to go through a course that is about the, the proclamation oh. of the family. Wow. And that is required? It's going to be a required course. You cannot graduate without going through this course. And the whole point, or at least, you know, the article that I found had like probably, I don't know, five or six um, like quotes from the uh, proclamation on the family um, that would be like the main talking points of the course. And like half of them were about um, heterosexual versus homosexual um, uh, families and relationships. So, yeah. (laughs) So there's that. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so so religion classes. Did you take the world religion class? Because I I took that one. I I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Um, They but they definitely had like you know a a church slant where Mm -hmm. after every religion that they would cover, we would have to go through and like compare that religion to the gospel and like how is it different from the gospel and how is oh, it wrong or different <laughs> and huh. cool. uh, so from that perspective I don't know I kind of felt like from a world religion's point of view it was kind of weird to be comparing it to another specific religion right was, yeah um, when I took that course it was it was done by a guy who used to work 
um, in what was it? It was some kind of TV show. It was like a kid show mm -hmm. um, that he was a part of for years and years. And so he was, you know, very animated. Mm -hmm. He was he would talk in weird voices sometimes. <laughs> and and uh, but but he was I thought he was actually pretty fair when it came to talking about the core beliefs of the different churches mm -hmm. and the different religions. Um, there was I think a few comments made about you know how this compares to Mormonism or whatever, but most of that stuff was. Um, from what I remember, um, brought on by students, like asking mm -hmm. questions. But uh, for mm -hmm. the most part, I thought he did a, actually a pretty good job. Um, anyway, so so BYU, mm -hmm. um, did, you didn't graduate from BYU. And no, I almost did. You almost did. <laughs> um, so, so was your transition from Mormonism and leaving BYU and going to U of U, right, mm -hmm. University of Utah, um, were those related? Were they just happening at the same time? Yes. So me leaving BYU happened at the same time that I left the church. That was not a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> so which came first? Um, leaving, leaving the church came first, and then immediately after, within uh -huh. month, a few months, I, I left so, BYU. So did you leave BYU then for cultural reasons? Was it out of conscience? Um, I would say, well, there are a lot of thing, a lot of different factors that went into it. You know, a lot of things going on in my life at the time. But mm. I, if I was, I don't know, I would say it was mostly had to do with my conscience and um, I don't know how much to get into. It's mostly that, conscience. Yeah, conscience. <laughs> yeah, just, just didn't feel right going to yeah, a I Mormon didn't wanna, university. And, and yeah. also the the idea of. In order to continue, I needed to get an ecclesiastical endorsement, mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to go through with that and sit in front of a bishop and say whatever it took just to continue right. my education, you mm -hmm. know. And there's always the worry that they're going to kick you out of school anyway yeah. and not transfer any of your credits. Mm -hmm. Right, which is a, a concern that I didn't even realize was legitimate until um, the last year or so. So I, you know, I graduated, uh, what was it, seven, eight years ago, whatever it was, and then kind of had my faith crisis um and then i started hearing about people that were having faith crises at byu mm -hmm. and having all of these problems and like trying to transfer or get you know diplomas and that kind of stuff it's like apparently for some people at least it becomes this huge ordeal and it just yeah. really screws their uh their education mm -hmm. yeah well it's know? a whole movement now yeah that's true free byu yeah free it's free BYU. Is that what it's I called? Think, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, um, it's an organization that's trying to get uh, BYU to not kick people out of the university um, just for leaving the Mormon Church. Mm -hmm. um, which, I mean, the whole reason why they're doing that is because you don't have to actually be Mormon to go to BYU. Mm -hmm. You just can't be ex-Mormon. Right. You know, like you can't go to BYU as a Mormon and then leave the church, but you can go to BYU not as a Mormon and then join the church. They love that. Because <laughs> being apostate is a completely separate category right. from religious freedom. Right. And they don't mm -hmm. want to have any association with apostates. Yeah. They're very clear about that these days. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So um, so this was what year? Like your junior year, sophomore year? It was actually my senior year. Senior year. So you were literally yeah. almost out. <laughs> and then all of this happens. Mm -hmm. So what? when um, would you say you started having like serious questions about the church? Um, for me, um, I would say that it started mainly in high school. I think I was around 16. Um, and there were a few things that had gone on bef before then that were kind, kind of made me feel a little bit iffy about the church, but it didn't mm -hmm. like completely wreck my testimony or anything like, like that. small things yeah, yeah I, I have a few I uh, examples okay. here so the first one I remember this was something that mom and dad had or had brought up with us at a family home evening lesson it was uh, talking about the the book of Lehi mm -hmm. the lost 116 oh. pages <laughs> 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 well, well the thing that I thought that was interesting about this was that they were bringing it up in a Faith promoting sense, oh, yeah. and oh, yeah. in my mind, I, w I immediately, as soon as I heard the story, I was like, "Well, this sounds exactly like a scam," and I said yeah. that to mom and dad, but I didn't say it like as in, um, I thought it was a scam. But you could but see I, how other I was like, I don't really think this scam. is a faith promoting story. Uh. You know, <laughs> like I wouldn't. 
apostates are going to twist this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's really funny. That's actually one of the things that um, they put in the uh, Mormon episode of South Park. Mm-hmm. They tell the story of Martin Harris <laughs> losing the 16 pa- 116 uh-huh. pages, and one of the characters um, hears the story, and he's like, wait, Mormons believe this? this? Yeah. <laughs> Mormons believe this? And they're, yeah. they still believe in the church? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so what is it about that story that strikes you as a scam? Well, because, so the story is about how, so the very first book of the Book of Mormon that Joseph Smith translated was the Book of Lehi. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a story about how he took his family uh, across the sea to America, which is the promised land. And then you get the story of the Nephites and the Lamanites. Um, and Martin Harris, who was Smith's scribe at the time, he re- kept repeatedly ask, asking Joseph Smith if he could take that the book that they had just translated, so the Book of Lehi, to show to his wife, because mm-hmm. his wife was having a lot of doubts about the author- authenticity right. of this. Right, she was skeptical. Whole, yeah, she was yeah. being skeptical. Which, again, the church just doesn't mm-hmm. like. <laughs> and so from, from the, the church's point of view, they, they kept reiterating that this was a, uh, a story about faith and how the Lord had repeatedly said no to Martin Harris. And then finally, uh-huh. after like three tries, he was given permission. And then uh-huh. immediately the Book of Lehi was lost. And they, then the story changed where instead of rewriting the story, the Book of Lehi, mm-hmm. Joseph Smith just um, re- skipped the book of Lehi and started in with the book of Nehi, Nephi, which was <laughs> just retelling the same story, but using, but it wasn't word for word. It was, yeah, it was a different perspective, different character telling the same yeah. story. Which you would think, mm. like in my mind, I was like, well, that sounds like a scam because it's like, well, clearly Joseph Smith mm. wasn't able to rewrite the book of Lehi. Right. But which, the, which is what uh, Martin Harris's mm-hmm. wife wanted him to do. Right. Like she wanted to compare the original 116 pages, the book of Lehi, with what Joseph Smith retranslated again Mm -hmm. and see if he could do it, duplicate it. Mm -hmm. Um, If he could, then great. It it, it, uh, shows that there's some credibility, some authenticity to it. Um, But the fact that he just um, instead miraculously had this other character tell more or less the same Mm -hmm. story, um, yeah, it's it's a bit shady. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And mom and dad were, were explaining it. They were saying that that from Joseph Smith's point of view, Joseph Smith was afraid that the bad bad guys were going to take the Book of Lehi and change the wording, mm-hmm. and so jo- yeah. and then when they compared it to Lehi, to Joseph Smith's version, they would be like, "Oh, look, see, it's a fraud." They're like, "Oh, well, no, the bad guys just changed it, so they had yeah. to do it this way." Which I don't know. It was just a weird story to me. It, it's just <laughs> it's an it's... awkward way to smooth the problem. Yeah, over. <laughs> yeah. It, it was all very contrived. It was just silly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and that's the, the, the genius of Joseph Smith, I think. Like, he had some really close calls where he almost got caught mm-hmm. um, doing some really bad things, and he just had the right thing to say and just weaseled out of it. Like, and we, the yeah. right people to support him. Right. <laughs> and the right people to believe him. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we could do a whole segment on that. Like, <laughs> Joseph Smith getting away with crap. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, so, so so that's one of the examples yeah. that started to chip away. Mm-hmm. And then I have, I have one more example, which okay. has to do with polygamy. So with this one is also polygamy is also a non faith promoting um, aspect mm-hmm. of our church. But at the same time, because we were raised in the Mormon church, and especially because our personal family history, we go back to Parley P. Pratt, who was a very prominent Mormon polygamist. Right. So this was something that, um, as a church and as a family, we um, confronted very openly and it wasn't something that I really um, questioned but I also didn't think was the most faith promoting thing to be spreading around. Right. It's probably why the church avoids it. <laughs> yeah. Because they realize it's not faith promoting. <laughs> but at the same time with with our family we always talked about how even though we don't practice it anymore it's still doctrinal like we'll be practicing it in after we die in heaven and mm-hmm. stuff and one example of this was um, with our aunt Michelle on my on mom's side of the family so mom our mom's mom died back in the 1950s when mom was a young girl and then her dad remarried our Mm step-grandma so we have our um, mom's side of the family and then we have mom's step side of the family and with the the Mormon temple ordinances the way that that worked is because um, 
mom's um, parents were originally sealed to each other in the temple. Oh. Um, according to the laws of polygamy, our grandpa was able to, to be remarried and resealed in the temple. Um, but because our grandma Jean, who is our step grandma, was also married and sealed in the temple, according to the laws of polygamy, she was not allowed to be remarried. Mm -hmm. So if grandpa had married some, someone who had not been previously married, they could have been sealed in the temple together. Mm -hmm. But because grandma Jean had already been previously married, they were not able to. And she didn't get her temple sealing annulled, right? I don't, I don't think I've ever heard. I don't think so. So she's, so she's sealed to her original husband, mm -hmm. and then our original grandparents are sealed. Are still sealed are to still each sealed, other. Are still sealed, but... So, okay. so our, our grandpa and our step-grandma are only married legally, mm -hmm. and then they had our Aunt Michelle. And I remember Mom talking about how oh, Aunt Michelle... So what's going to happen to her? Yeah, she's like, what's going to happen to me? She's like, she, Aunt Michelle's still one of our aunts who's very faithful in the church, and I don't think that it, it really uh, shook her faith to such a huge, huge, huge extent that mm -hmm. she would question the church and leave the church, but she was just like, what's going to happen to me? And Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, so that kind and, of put another crack in the shelf? Well, to, for me, I wasn't really bothered by that so much. I was just like, I, I kind of felt like, oh, well, that will be worked out in in the afterlife. And Mom always talked about it as, you know, Aunt Michelle just having faith in God. And I was like, okay, that's acceptable. I don't know. But then mm -hmm. when I, what really started to bother me about that was um, when President Hinckley was being interviewed by Larry King Live back in 1998. Oh, my gosh. I forgot about that. Interview. <laughs> <laughs> and I, this was just before I turned 12 years old, so I was really young, um, and I don't know, it just really bothered me because, I, and I, I have some notes the here. Bothered. The The interview bothered me. Okay. And uh, President Hinckley's response to Larry King really bothered me uh -huh. because the, um, in part of the interview when they were talking about polygamy, they... Um, they were talking about some Mormon polygamists, like current modern day Mormon polygamists, but they are not currently part of our Mormon church because the Mormon church headquartered in Salt Lake City does not endorse polygamy anymore. Right. And so we were like completely trying to separate ourselves from them. But Larry King like kept pushing President Hinckley and was like, well, what do you think about these polygamists and what do you think we should do like at a legal level? What should the state do and all this stuff? Uh -huh. And President Hinckley just kept saying, we have nothing to do with this. Uh, you know, like stop asking me kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Right. But then at the very end of this um, part of the interview, Larry King a asks him specifically, he says, do you condemn it? And President Hinckley says, I condemn it, yes, as a practice because I think it is not doctrinal. It is not legal. And then he goes on to quote the Article of Faith, the the twelfth Article of Faith, which talks about um, we believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates in obeying, honoring, um, and sustaining the law. And it wasn't until that point in the interview that Larry King finally changes the subject. So he kept uh -huh. pushing and pushing and pushing President Hinckley until he finally says that polygamy is not doctrinal. And that really, really bothered me. <laughs> right, because it's kind of, because uh, it's not consistent with mm -hmm. what the church actually teaches about polygamy. Yeah. Because in, in Doctrine and Covenants, which is one of the books of, of Mormon scripture, uh, was it section 132, it talks about how polygamy is the new and everlasting covenant. It's it's one of the things that you have to do in order to get into to heaven. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that uh, Brigham Young, uh, the second president of the church, um, was really big on. You have to be a polygamist to get to the highest mm -hmm. levels of heaven. You have to. And now for, uh, you know, the modern prophet to say, well, it's not doctrinal. It is doctrinal. Right. Like, we have the doctrine. We yeah. have the page number. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and this entire time in the, the interview, when I was listening, I kept thinking about the whole, you know, milk before meat concept, like trying to give an easier answer, not like coming right out and talking mm -hmm. about it from a doctrinal level. But uh, it wasn't until the point where he said it was not doctrinal that I was that I was just like, well, he's, this is not just him being doing milk before meat. He's mm -hmm. actually being um, deceptive. Deceptive. Yeah, which is another thing that the Mormon Church has a history of when it mm -hmm. comes to polygamy is being deceptive. Like mm -hmm. we have affidavits, legal documents, of known polygamists signing 
these papers saying that they're not polygamists. Uh-huh. Joseph Smith had a number of people sign uh, similar papers saying that he wasn't a polygamist. And at Including least his wives. Exactly. Like a, at least a couple of them were married to him when they signed the document. <laughs> yeah. You know, like like the church has no problem um, lying if it ser- serves their purposes. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that they probably do it less these days because they probably have less to lie about. Well, but it's easier to catch on. It, too, yeah, true. These days. Yeah. Far it's more a lot, people are keeping track. It's a lot harder to get away with it now. Um, Anyway, so so polygamy was an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, the Book of Lehi was an issue, and these are things that um, were issues for you while you were in high school. Um, well, a little bit younger than high school. This was actually before I started having my faith crisis. So, like I mentioned, um, the Larry King Live interview was back in 1998. So this was like right before I became a beehive. So I was really okay. still pretty young. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I was in high school, um, that was when I really started, like. It wasn't just things that made me like think, oh, this seems a little bit off. But it was actually like at a more conscious level. I was like, oh. I don't know if the church is true anymore. What's going on? You know. Okay. Um, so. So when was that? That happened in high school when I was about 16 years old. Okay. Um, and I remember specifically there there was, I remember coming across something where someone from high school had mentioned to me a historical inaccuracy in the Book of Mormon which I was then, I I decided that I wanted to go online and research it and be like, like uh-huh. kind of prove them wrong, be like, well, there are no historical inaccuracies in the Book of Mormon. Because, You're just misinterpreting it, yeah. you don't understand the typical responses. Yeah, yeah. so I went online, and this specific <laughs> example was about the brother of Jared. Um, and so the story of brother of Jared is about how they came across the ocean in these barges, uh-huh. And this happened before even the story of Lehi and Nephi. Um, and this was like an ancient people to Nephi and Lehi. And later on in the Book of Mormon, they eventually come across this a- ancient people who had discovered America before they had. Uh-huh. And then they found their scriptures and put it into the Book of Mormon. Right. Which is an interesting thing that that uh, I've noticed. Like I, I've been kind of rereading the Book of Mormon the last year or so and like writing down some notes. And one of the things that I noticed is that there's lots of references to other groups coming from Jerusalem and mm-hmm. inhabiting America at this time. Like, this was the, the whole point of the Book of Mormon. Like, mm-hmm. this is where the Native Americans came from. Like, they came from Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And they gave several examples throughout the Book of Mormon of people doing exactly that. Uh-huh. You know, so the fact that there's no corroborating evidence, we don't have any artifacts from Jerusalem or from Palestine in America, there's no like linguistic uh, consistencies there's uh, no la- no uh, uh, artifacts there's no what am i looking for dna, uh, DNA yeah that, that's the, another big one like the dna doesn't match up mm-hmm. it's like that that is huge mm-hmm. you know and, and mormons nowadays a lot of the apologists are saying things like oh well they weren't the primary ones like yeah. like we used to think that but now we just think that they're you know among the ancestors mm-hmm. um like they're not like the primary ancestors it's like no that's not the message in the book of mormon the book of mormon doesn't read that way at all yeah you know like every group that the the, the nephites and the lamanites in the book of mormon come across also came from jerusalem mm-hmm. every one that i've found every single one <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. No, kind of derailed okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. Um, but yeah, so the, so with the brother of Jared, um, first of all, I didn't even go back and, and re-look up what the, the specific historical inaccuracies were of this story. I think it had something to do with them saying that they weren't able to cross the, the ocean to the Americas in the amount of time that the Book of Mormon said. But to mm-hmm. me, I was like, well, that seems like a very small thing, especially when you consider, like, there are other things in the book of, um, in the story of the brother of Jared, like that how, is fantastical. yeah, like he mm-hmm. presents these stones to God and God, right. like, touches them with his fingers and suddenly they, like, they light, light up. up the entire yeah. barge. So, like, right. the entire story <laughs> is just this big, fantastic, you know. Right, it's, it's mythology. Yeah. It's, it's legend. So yeah. it wasn't like I had never heard anything like this before, um, about like, like not so, so what was it so, about the time time span that was inconsistent um i didn't even go back and look it back up because I, oh. because <laughs> my point is that with this story it wasn't that big of a deal uh-huh. but it got me online and i started researching other things and those were the things that i actually went back on to get 
um, more information on for for this interview. Interesting. And the two things that I remember, well, first of all, I should mention that after after I went through this faith crisis, I ended up deciding that um, I ultimately decided that the um, the decision to leave whether or not to leave the church. Um, was too big of a decision for me to make at such a young age. I was only 16 years old. I hadn't moved out of the house yet. I hadn't mm -hmm. really made any adult decisions for myself yet. I'm still very dependent yeah, on mom so and dad. I, I decided that I wanted to stay in the church and work on building my testimony, and I convinced myself that it was all my fault and that uh, my faith crisis mm -hmm. was because I couldn't understand these things well enough. Uh -huh. Um which is a, a tactic that they love to use. Yeah. You know, they, they tell uh, converts or people investigating the church, thinking about joining the church, you know, all you have to do is pray about it, mm -hmm. and then God will give you a sign. He'll give you, you know, the warm, fuzzy feelings burning, burning in your bosom. And if it doesn't happen for you, if you don't mm -hmm. get this sensation that they're talking about when you pray, then either you're not worthy, you need to repent first, mm -hmm. you, uh, you need to have, you know, a certain level of belief, um, you need to be... What, what's the phrase? You need to have a contrite spirit. <laughs> you know, um, it's all weaseling out yeah. of the actual issue, which is you didn't get an answer to the prayer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And so for me at this time in my life, I decided to uh, destroy all of my research. So I no longer have it. <laughs> but I do remember. As an act of faith. Yeah, as an act of faith. But I do remember there were two things that still stuck out to me that I that I did go back and research for this interview. And um, one of them was about the Book of Abraham. And the other one was about Brigham Young and Blood Atonement. Those mm -hmm. two mm. things really disturbed me and kind of like shattered my my testimony in the church at, at that point in time. Okay, so let's let's... Um, talk about the book of Abraham because that's one that comes up a lot for a lot of Mormons um, so what is it about the book of Abraham that struck you as I guess inauthentic or mm -hmm. problematic so with the book of Abraham I guess the biggest thing is with um, comparing it to the book of Mormon the book of Mormon the, the story of how we got the book of Mormon has always been a big part of, of Mormonism like we always talk about how Joseph dug, yeah, and... dug it up out of the hill and like where mm -hmm. the came from. But I didn't wasn't really aware of where the Book of Abraham came from. I just knew that uh -huh. it was a book that was put at the end of the Book of Mormon. Right. And turns out that the story is that Joseph Smith came across this traveling mummy exhibition where he bought some <laughs> Egyptian papyri. It just sounds so shady. And it then does. translated it, and it turns out, randomly, that it was the story of Abraham. R randomly. <laughs> or conveniently. <laughs> yeah. So, and then that was uh, canonized in 1880 and became part of our Pearl of Great Price, which is um, put in the back of the Book of Mormon. So, but then uh, later on, it turns out that we came across fragments of this papyri and we translated it. And it turns out that the, these manuscripts have, they say, they say it has no resemblance to Joseph Smith's Book of Abraham and that it actually turns out that it was a, um, it was common Egyptian funerary texts. Right, so, so basically, Joseph Smith comes across this papyrus, these mm -hmm. writings with these uh, hieroglyphics on it he claims to be able to translate it, and this is at a time when uh, scholars didn't know how to read this language. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how to read ancient Egyptian, so it didn't matter what he said, right? He could have said anything yeah. and claimed that this is what it said. And he did. And he did. And and now that modern Egyptologists, actual scholars who understand the language, um, as, as they you know look at the papyrus, they look at the facsimiles, the pictures. Mm -hmm. Um, their interpretation of it is wildly different. Mm -hmm. Like like not even a single thing mm -hmm. is the same with what Joseph Smith said. Yeah. Um, to the point where um, when you ask an Egyptologist, a modern day Egypt Egyptologist um, about these papyri, the, most of them either say it's gibberish mm -hmm. or they laugh at you. <laughs> you know, like they do not respect... Um, the Mormon mm -hmm. translation of the Book of Abraham at all—they like it's ridiculous to them, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, so mm -hmm. so Book of Abraham is a huge problem. Um, it, it's not what Joseph Smith claimed it was. 
his translation isn't an accurate translation. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that, that I found out fairly recently, um, actually from reading the CES letter, um, which is a, gr- a great document that everybody should look up, cesletter.com, um, is that one in one of the facsimiles, um, in, it's a very small part of it, it's like the very bottom corner of one of the facsimiles, um, there's a, a picture of a god, an mm-hmm. Egyptian god, and Joseph, Joseph Smith's translation was like, this is God the Father sitting on his throne, um, <laughs> something, something along those lines, right? And it, it turns out that it's not God the Father, at least not according yeah. to uh, actual experts. It's actually a fertility god, and With he an has erect penis. He has an erect <laughs> penis. <laughs> That's really funny. Nice. So, if you're if you're looking for um, something just completely useless and random to know, um, mm. in Mormon scripture they have a picture of an erect penis. Mm. <laughs> Okay, so so that's it for the book of Abraham. Uh-huh. Uh, what was the other one? Um, Joe's, uh, oh, sorry, Brigham Young and Blood Atonement. Blood Atonement, right. Which okay. I had so never heard that. of before. So apparently Brigham Young had a lot of really, really crazy ideas mm-hmm. that the Mormon church just doesn't want to even acknowledge. And it turns out Brigham Young, who is the man that our university is named after, right. He was just crazy. Yeah, he's just insane. <laughs> he is crazy. Yeah, he, he was a megalomaniacal tyrant. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he power wanted, hungry. Yeah, he wanted all of the women. He wanted all His of the wife power. Had like fifty five wives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and over a hundred kids or something like yeah. that. Like it was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So so he has some fun quotes. Yeah. So blood atonement. Yeah. So with the idea of blood atonement is that there are certain crimes such as murder that are considered to be so uh, like bad and evil that not even the atonement applies to them and in because of that in order to atone for your sins you have to basically uh shed your own blood upon the ground or kill yourself okay and it's something that's no longer accepted in the church but it was being practiced very heavily apparently or i don't know exactly how heavily but Mm -hmm. it was um brigham young was encouraging this this behavior um during around the time when we were settling in utah and basically setting up this theocracy there right (laughs) my understanding of it is that it was still more of just a threat Hmm. i haven't come across anything of him actually enacting it or them being able to officially tie it to blood atonement okay yeah well because i think originally the the idea was um was that it would? It was supposed to be a voluntary choice. Mm-hmm. So um, you would have to do it to yourself. You would have to do yeah. it to yourself. It's like all samurai like. Yeah, <laughs> which is funny because then the concept of suicide is you mm-hmm. don't make it to heaven. Right. Yeah, <laughs> if you kill yourself. Oh, yeah. That's true. So it's like yeah. a huge contradiction. <laughs> yeah. So it was just talking about how. Um, yeah, the 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 idea of this blood atonement and how it might have been influencing the laws in Utah at the time, which allowed for capital punishment. And it might might have also contributed to the Mountain Med- Meadows massacre, um, which I haven't gone back and like analyzed all of this to to know whether or not like or how much it uh, has influenced these things. But oh. but it was mostly just the the basic idea that you know you, there are certain things that are so horrible that you need to kill yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like that's oh my gosh, that's just crazy. Especially like if anybody actually did it. Like, do we have any examples of that? Like. I didn't look it up um, to that extent. I might, I might have when I originally did the research, though. Oh. Yeah, I was never able to come across any examples when I read about it. Well, didn't you? Isn't it? Wasn't it a part of the temple ceremony? Um, those are the blood oaths. Oh. Blood oaths are a little bit different. Um, it, basically, the idea is you go to the temple, you participate in the endowment ceremony, um, and during the endowment ceremony, you learn certain things about getting into heaven. They're super secret. And you take an oath where uh, you basically say that if you ever divulge this information, um, you vow to slit your own throat and cut your own stomach. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's where blood atonement came from. So, okay, it's so they're the same, linked. Yeah, they're yeah. linked together. Because okay. Warren, cause I know in the FLDS um, sect, uh-huh. Warren Jeffs used blood atonement against lots of people. Like He never oh, like, right. actually did it, but he was a huge advocate for it. 
which is part of the reason why so uh. many people couldn't leave. Because apostasy is one of the things that they would do the blood atonement for. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I don't really know a whole lot about the FLDS church. Um, I mean, you've, you've been reading a lot more about that than I have. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's some crazy stuff that goes on. Like Warren Jeffs Warren was kind of Jeffs a, is a when messed up human hell. being. Yeah. We, <laughs> he did some crazy things. Yeah, I mean, his dad was crazy too, but not as bad as Warren. Really? Okay. And isn't there a, a new movie that came out or is coming out? Yeah, Prophet's Prey. Prophet's Prey. That. That's Prey as in P-R-E-Y? Mm-hmm. It's based on, oh my gosh, what's his name? A book. <laughs> Private investigator. Private investigator? Yeah, I read it. I can't remember what his name is anymore. Okay. So, based on a true story, then? Yeah, it's this guy that um, investigated the FLDS um, compound down in Hilldale. Mm -hmm. And basically, I mean, he wasn't, he was kind of instrumental in the capture of Warren Jeffs, but like on the outskirts of it. So, it's everything that leads up to that and his part that he played in it. Okay. Cool. We're. Interesting, I should say. It is interesting. It's <laughs> awful. I shouldn't say cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where were we? We kind of interrupted. Derailed again. Yeah. There we go, derailing. So, well, those are basically all my thoughts on blood atonement. Okay. So, so just problematic, but, disturbing, yeah. um, caused, caused you to wonder if the church is actually true. Mm-hmm. If these are really inspired prophets yeah. of God. Well, especially because it's <clears> such a happy and uplifting gospel is that's right. how they teach it to you and so true. then you come across something like this and it's like black and white difference mm-hmm. yes yeah, the smiley it's face like version. how did what we're learning now come from this crap <laughs> that mm-hmm. went on before well that's a good question how how did the church change its image they used to be very fundamentalist very very conservative um, mm-hmm. If you go down, very private. Very private. If you go down to any of the polygamous compounds, that is how the Mormons of you know hundred years ago lived, you know, and now when you look at you know the Mormons of today, you have you know the smiley faced uh, missionaries wandering around talking the to Mitt people, Romneys. the Mitt Romneys, you know, and it's it's very upbeat, it's very positive. Um, they like to think it's pro family, and it's in a lot of ways it is. Um, it's just not pro everybody's family, <laughs> you know. Um, I don't know. It, it would be interesting to kind of look into the transition. Um, I know that there were lots of things that changed in the fifties and sixties, uh, which was when they closed their their financial records um, and they started doing a lot more private investing uh, with their finances. Um, I don't know. It would be an interesting topic to to research how they made that shift. So, okay, so let's talk about, um, you know, so you had a a sort of mini crisis of faith Mm -hmm. in high school, Mm -hmm. um, and you had all this research, and then you kind of doubled down, tried to recommit to the church, Mm -hmm. and you threw away all of your apostate writings, and and then you went to BYU. Uh Um, What was that like? Like, did you still have these these thoughts, these questions? Yeah. Did you shove them out of mind? Uh, Yeah, well, I shoved them out of my mind, so... I I ex- still experienced everything, but it was um, more like at a subconscious level. I didn't allow myself to even admit to myself that, that I was having issues because I thought that that mm-hmm. it, just doing that would make my testimony weak, and I was trying to strengthen mm. my testimony. Um, so it was. So you were doubting your doubts before that was a thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> there, there's another phrase um they, they don't use it quite so much and it's usually used more in a snarky sort of way. Um it's called st- uh, stamp out doubt. Mm-hmm. Um it's, it's the same idea. It's like doubts come from Satan, you need mm-hmm. to stamp them out. Yeah. You know, but but it it comes across as a very cultish. Yeah. Um you know, don't question, don't don't think about these things. Mm-hmm. Anything like this is from the devil. And he's trying to deceive you by asking these questions, um, which is what Mormons do. They just kind of gloss it over, make it look a, a little bit nicer uh-huh. um, a lot of times. Anyway, so BYU, you're having these these thoughts. Yeah, but I wasn't like confronting them. Yeah, mm-hmm. wasn't confronting them or acknowledging them. I um, just kept pushing them out, 
pushing them away and it made me feel like very conflicted and this went on for uh, about six years of just telling myself that it was all my own problem and it was my own weaknesses and I needed to just strengthen my testimony and pray mm -hmm. more and uh, do more church things. Did you ever try talking to anyone about them, about your doubts? Uh, not since I was originally qu questioning them in high school. I talked so to one talked of to my a... one of my friends in high school, and then it didn't go over very well. Was and the I person out. Uh, was the person a member? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and and how did they react? Well, they reacted by crying. And then their parents found them, and then, well, I don't want to go into that. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't good. No. <laughs> and it, okay. And I assume this was somebody that you were close to, like a friend. Mm -hmm. And then did it put strain on your relationship? It, or did they just kind of It was just something that we it? didn't acknowledge mm -hmm. after that point. Okay. Like, we talked about it. We were like, this is freaking us out. What do we do? Let's move on and never talk about it again. This, it sounds like... <laughs> and I've never acknowledged it to her since then. <laughs> right. It's, it sounds like um, you have like these two little kids. One of them says, I got a Ouija, a Ouija board. <laughs> and the other one's like, oh no. Isn't that satanic? We should do it. I don't know. It sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> and then they do it and they never talk and about never it talk again. About it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so... so for the most part, nobody is aware mm -hmm. that you're going through this faith crisis. Nobody knows the questions that you have about the, the church. Mm -hmm. And then it all cul culminates in your senior year? Or? Yeah. So basically by um, during my senior year at BYU, I finally just woke up one day and I, I didn't tell myself, like I didn't have a moment where I was like, this is it, the church is no longer true. But I did tell myself that it was time to confront these things and not just throw them in the back of my head, but to like start looking into the issues again. Mm -hmm. To actually ask the question. Yeah. And this, this became, this turned into about a, a two month process where I was looking into things, researching things, but I really started realizing that during this, this whole six years where I stayed in the church, um, it really wasn't so much anymore about the historical inaccuracies. That was more of uh, the catalyst that started making me doubt things. Okay. But then watching things within the church while I was having these major issues, I started realizing more it was, that it was more about like the just the subtle hypocrisies within the church. Um, hmm. And so the historical issues, things... so what you're saying is the historical issues got you on the road of mm -hmm. asking questions and having doubts, yeah. but that's not what really pushed you away. Right. It, okay. It was, it had more to do with issues like, of personal revelation and issues of faith, mm -hmm. um, issues, uh, with sinning and, um, all of these things that I, that I felt like could be generalized to all of religion, where the historical inaccuracies mm -hmm. only were only about Mormonism. Mm -hmm. um, so you had more foundational questions, like, mm -hmm. um, like not just is the is the Mormon Church true? It's is there a God at all? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that that is one of the main differences. Like when I when I first started questioning things in high school, it was still from a Christian point of view. So my biggest worries at the time were thinking about like heaven or hell mm -hmm. you know there was like this life or death situation where if if the mainstream christians were right and the mormons were wrong then that meant that i was going to go to hell those kind of things that that really oh, scared right. me mm -hmm. whereas with this crisis it was from more of a secular outlook where i was questioning all of religion and just being like i don't think this is very healthy at all in general mm -hmm. um so from from that point of view, from the secular point of view, it wasn't so much about um, am I going to hell or heaven question, but it was more um, dealing with the social pressures and family pressures of what what will this mean to me if I 
choose to leave the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the real outcomes. Yeah, <laughs> right, the, the, tangible the real outcomes. Life, yeah, the real life outcomes. <laughs> the the ones that affect the one life that we know we have. Yeah. So um, so family pressures, social pressures. Mm-hmm. That was a big a big part of keeping you in. Initially. Yeah, initially. Initially. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then what happened? Um, you just finally break. Just realizing that it really wasn't. Uh, worth it in the end realizing how unhappy I actually was Mm -hmm. during this whole time and and I used to think things like you know I I had that outlook of even if the church isn't true the church is still good and it's still still a good way to raise your children in and Mm -hmm. to teach them morals and all this stuff but then as I was stepping away from it I was like well do I really want to submit my children to this and to all this these doubts and feeling like having doubts was going to send you to hell mm-hmm. and and there were there was a lot of unhealthy things about religion where i was like i don't know if this is this is worth it anymore so there's so overall mm-hmm. there's not really a reason for you then to join any church yeah okay and that i think that you can have healthier attitudes um by not giving into that um mm-hmm. yeah. right so so one of the things okay so this reminds me of a topic that comes up a lot in in atheist forums mm-hmm. and conversations, uh, debates sometimes, um, it's the concept that anything that religion does that's good mm-hmm. that, that is for the good of humanity is not exclusive to religion. Meaning, you don't have to be in that particular religion to do that good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whereas the things that are bad about religion, generally speaking, or very often are exclusive to those religions. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, things like genital mutilation of children, Mm -hmm. you know, circumcision. Um, You look at the homophobia of the Mormon church, the the way that these recent policies are affecting families and children. Mm -hmm. Um, You talk about social pressures and the the anxiety that comes from thinking that just asking questions like, is this church true? Is there really a God? Like that could have an eternal consequence. or the more lighthearted version of that that was posted on Reddit the other other day, um, <laughs> the 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 Mormon Church. Anybody who wonders about the authenticity of the Mormon Church, uh, I'm paraphrasing, of course, um, should just keep in mind that they teach you that you might have eternal consequences for drinking coffee. <laughs> 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 you know, it's like there are real world things, um, and and so yeah, the the bad things about religion um, are genuinely bad. Uh-huh. And, and completely unneeded and can be avoided by just leaving religion. Yeah. Okay, so so at this point, um, I mean, it sounds like now you've come to a place where religion, just pretty much across the board, is either all bad or not sufficiently good. Mm-hmm. Um, sounds like you don't believe in God, so you identify as an atheist then? Yeah. Okay. Um, when did you come to that realization? Um... It pretty much happened during that, that two-month process at BYU where I was leaving the church. I was just like, well, it really comes down to I just don't believe in God. Yeah. Um, and the, the interesting thing about that point, too, is um, during this time, there was a big, you know, atheist movement. Uh-huh. And there, there were some – and I was – So a growing atheist movement nationally, locally. Yeah, and how a lot of people were making comments about how people who were leaving their church and um, becoming atheists were doing it to follow the crowd. And I felt like that was completely opposite of my experience because Mm -hmm. I left the church while I was at BYU. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any atheists. In fact, I didn't even associate with anyone who wasn't like a BYU Mormon. Mm-hmm. And and even when I was doing research like anti Mormon research, I like that was back in high school when I was still had a Christian perspective. So mm-hmm. none of the influences at that time were like atheist or secular. Mm-hmm. Um, so to call it a fad is it could be for some people, but that wasn't mm-hmm. my experience. And I I felt like um, it was kind of important from from my perspective where people were kind of. Well, I mean, you were you were in hiding essentially. Yeah, and and I wanted to just um, like for example on Facebook, um, 
once I got up the courage, I actually put myself as an atheist on Facebook, but uh-huh. it wasn't like in a way to like be in your face or anything like that. It was more as a sign to just show show people that it's nothing to be ashamed of and mm-hmm. it's not a dirty word and that if you are kind of like hiding kind of how I was yeah. where everyone is accusing atheists of just sinning and going to hell and all these things being immoral yeah and being immoral <laughs> uh, that that's not actually the case so we, we talked a little bit about family pressures mm-hmm. um, I understand that you've had some difficult conversations especially with our parents right mm-hmm. um, do you want to maybe talk about those a little bit or is that a little a little too much <laughs> <laughs> We don't have to. For me, um, conversation with family is something that I generally avoid, but has happened. Yeah. Are there, are there any examples, or maybe maybe a, a positive example of talking to family? <laughs> no, not really. No, Nothing they've all been bad? Positive. Well, okay. Um, let me think. Because, for instance, I, I mean, I've had a few rough conversations Especially with mom, mm-hmm. um, I've I've had a couple rough conversations with uh, Melanie. Uh-huh. Um, one of my early conversations with Melissa was kind of rough. Mm-hmm. That one was about uh, contraception. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that was, a, yeah, awful conversation. Anyway, um, but I've had good conversations with with uh, Jason and Kate. Yeah. Um, so I, w- I wouldn't say that it's all bad. Yeah, it's not all bad. Um, that was true. I, I haven't really talked to Jason and Kate very much, but I do remember Kate asking me one time, I can't remember what it was specifically, but she was basically just asking me, like, if, if things were all right between me and mom, kind of like, like she Uh was trying to be concerned and try to see things from my perspective. Whereas a lot of times the conversation is about trying to convince me to come back to church. Um, uh-huh. Where she was like kind of stepping out and just being like, "Well, whatever." So she was more empathetic to yeah. your position. And Melissa did that one time too, where it, it was kind of funny. I, I was out in New York visiting her, and she made some sort of comment about how Brett had a friend who was kind of in town, except for we were in New York and he was like down in Pennsylvania. But we were like. On the East Coast, so that was close mm. enough, right? I don't know. <laughs> and, I, and she was just like, oh, there's this guy. He's, like, in Pennsylvania, and he's friends with Brett. And, you know, he left the church, too. Maybe you would be interested in dating him. And I was, you like, you guys me, are both tall? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, it was interesting because, like, you know, everyone always jokes about, you know, people trying to set you up on dates. But I oh. actually appreciated that conversation because she was, she was coming from the perspective of, like, you've left the church uh-huh. and... And she was still looking out for yeah. your well-being. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't, like, cool. trying to get me to date Mormons, which... Right. Yeah. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's actually an interesting thing to bring up, because in the conversation, the first conversation that I had with Jason and Kate, mm-hmm. which overall I think was a, a good conversation, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> uh, I think it was Kate actually asked me, so would you ever consider dating a, M- a Mormon? <laughs> 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 and I said, I think my, my response was... Um, I don't have anything against dating a Mormon, but I could see them having a problem dating me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you were really upfront about that when we started dating. Right. I, yeah, because I, I, I know that this is the sort of thing that causes rifts in relationships, mm-hmm. especially marital relationships. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you if you don't have that transparency, then it can only cause problems. Yeah. At least that's been what I've seen. Um, I've, I've seen a few people... Uh, try to make it work, have a mixed faith marriage. Um, and, you know, some of them make it work, at least for a little while. Uh, I I mean, I'm granted most of my friends aren't all that old. Um, so, you know, my, my limited experience, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, like mixed faith, faith marriages are just rough. Like, I wouldn't wish that on, upon anybody. Mm-hmm. Like, it's one of the reasons why I avoided um, dating in general when I started to realize that I had doubts. It's like... Like, I need to sort this stuff out, my religion stuff out, before I start getting into a serious relationship because I know that that's going to affect any relationship that I get into, mm-hmm. you know, and it can can be yeah. damaging. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Okay, so so things are. Would you say that things are um, smooth with family members or tense? Kind of. Uh, I don't know. Depends on which family member we're talking about, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Most is mostly about. Uh, I haven't really talked to anyone mm -hmm. recently or had a conversation about religious topics. So. Yeah. Yeah, me either, actually. Now that I'm thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, the closest thing that I've had to a conversation like that was the picture on Facebook that I put up. Mm -hmm. And a few family members <laughs> commented on that. But, I mean, that wasn't really about religion so much as um, them saying that I was being disrespectful. <laughs> yeah. We kind of talked about something in Spokane with your mom. I just can't remember what it was. Oh. Yeah, I can't remember either. She made a few comments, and I, th I think there were a few comments about, like, political stuff. Yeah, and... it was mostly political, but there was one church-related comment. I can't remember what we talked about. Oh, oh, I remember now. She, uh, let's see, we were, we were talking about the difference between religion and mythology. Oh, yeah. And yeah. and I made the comment <laughs> that, uh, you know, every everybody, uh, oh, yeah, it was, it was about... Um, Greek mythology, mm -hmm. like the Greek pantheon, and how in the, you know, that, that time period in that region, those people believed in those gods in that religion every bit as fervently as, and as uh, genuinely as she did in Mormonism. Mm -hmm. And she got offended. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. and she was like, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. It's like, like, seriously, like, like people believe in all of these different religions just as much as you do. Like, 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 don't even go to, you know, ancient religions. Just talk about different forms of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Talk about different forms of Mormonism, um, you know, Ju uh, Judaism, Islam, you know. Yeah. It's like they believe in their religions just as much as the most stalwart Mormon does, you know. And, and when you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it, a lot of them have the same reasons mm -hmm. as Mormons do. And that was something that I didn't really realize until after I had already left uh, Mormonism mm -hmm. um, started doing more research and like you know the testimonials of a Muslim compared to those of an evangelical Christian compared to a Mormon right. it's mm -hmm. like wow they are all saying the exact same thing mm -hmm. you know it's like just swap Mormon for Hindu and <laughs> you know <laughs> and it's the same thing mm -hmm. you know so um, is there anything then that would um, get you to go back to church like what would it take to get you to go back to church well there's the unitarian ver what was the word universalist Uni yeah unitarian universalist uh -huh. so something like along those ideas where i don't really think that they're even is even really about religion it's more about community mm -hmm. or depending on the church because it's so non-dogmatic that each church is different. Um, something like that. Where, But I don't really think that that would compare to an actual religion because... Just okay. dynamic. Is yeah. Different. Yeah. So, so, okay. So looking for a community, mm -hmm. a positive community base. Okay. And that is, a, you know, that is a, a thing that a lot of people uh, stick around in their mm -hmm. churches mm -hmm. for especially mormons because they have a very close-knit community um and a lot of people don't want to leave that mm -hmm. um you have in, in utah there's a, a phenomenon called the cultural mormon yeah. you know which is sort of like a cultural jew i guess yeah. <laughs> you know like they they like the practices they like the rituals they like the community they like the potlucks yeah, but they just uh, don't believe it they just don't believe it <laughs> yeah. you know um so what would it take then to get you to go to the Mormon church? I don't think I would go back to the Mormon church. Even if you found like evidence, they found like the Book of Mormon? No, well, um... Know, this is a completely unfair, loaded question. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, um, like, I, like how I mentioned how the historical inaccuracies were um part of the catalyst for me leaving the church uh -huh. but it was actually more it went more it went deeper than that in order to get me out of the church uh -huh. um talking about just general issues with religion 
and how I felt like religion was not didn't promote the healthiest attitudes and I and I feel like it's um it does does more, more harm, harm than good yeah it does more harm than good mm -hmm. and I feel like um the the historical accuracy of the church parallels the doctrinal accuracy so if the church, if religion is negative and is not promoting um, good things, good things yeah. and personal growth in the way that I think is good. That matches that, your value system. Yeah, that matches my value system. Mm -hmm. Then I think that it, it would then show that the historical inaccuracy, I just don't think that it would ever match up. Okay, so it's a moot point. Yeah. It just isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Cool. Well, um, I think that's about all I had as far as the, the interview goes. Um, do you have any other questions, Corinne? Well, did you want to talk about that book? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so... I need kind of your ideas now. Yeah, so um, I so brought this, this book? book with me. This is just a book that uh, I've been reading recently it's called games primates play and i thought it was interesting because i um okay <laughs> let's see i guess i can give an introduction about this this was written by um a man named dario maestropieri i think is how you pronounce it and he is a oh. professor of comparative human development evolutionary biology neurobiology and psychiatry and behavioral science at the University of Chicago. Good so, <laughs> wow. and he just basically is talking about primatology and how that relates to human relationships. And the reason why I was reading this book, um, and I thought it was be, would be interesting to share in this interview, was because uh -huh. I was inspired to to read this book from a lecture that I had watched a few years ago, where a man, another primatologist named. Robert Sapolsky gave a lecture called The Uniqueness of Humans, and there were some points in there that talked about religious psychology from the perspective of humans being primates, um, which I thought was oh. interesting. Oh, okay. So basically, I'm, I'm just guessing now, but he, he found that orangutans are Catholics and gorillas are Protestants. Basically. That, that's more or less it. <laughs> <laughs> Something along those Something lines. Something along those I lines. I into more detail about that. <laughs> okay. okay, so, so uh, what do you got? Okay, so I guess I can start by talking about how our family does not believe in evolution. Oh, mom told me two, two or three years ago, she believes in evolution now. She does believe in evolution yeah. now. Yeah. What did she, she say about it? I have no idea. <laughs> she she just wanted to make the point. She believes in it now. Okay, um, that's interesting. But but I know exactly what you're talking about. Like growing up, I yeah. I remember her walking in on me once when I was watching a, a documentary on the Discovery Channel mm -hmm. um, about dinosaurs, mm -hmm. and she just walked up to the TV and turned it off. About dinosaurs? <laughs> yes, because they were talking about how the Earth was millions of years old and and how they know this and that. And dinosaurs don't fit anywhere into the yeah. Genesis story. Exactly. See, I don't really remember so much about our family protesting the world being millions of years old, but we de I definitely mm -hmm. remember the protesting of us literally evolving from right. monkeys. Right. Um, but even, even though our family didn't believe in evolution growing up, it still wasn't quite as black and white as that. And one story that I have of that is um, there's this experiment that dad used to like to talk, talk about. Okay. Um, I didn't look it up and I'm not sure what monkey it is, but I think it was about chimpanzees. And he always liked to talk about how um, their favorite food was actually not a banana. Bananas was their second favorite food and their favorite food was lettuce. Huh. And they did this experiment where they t put a bunch of these chimps into a room and they and they presented some bananas to them, but they mm -hmm. kept them out of reach so that they could they weren't able to eat the bananas. Um, okay. And since bananas are their second favorite food, the the monkeys the chimps got really excited and in anticipation of eating these bananas, 
And then um, the second half of the experiment was them take, removing the bananas and then giving them lettuce, which is their favorite food. And mm -hmm. the chimpanzees just went completely crazy and threw this huge tantrum about how they didn't want lettuce, they wanted bananas. Interesting. And Dad loved telling <laughs> that story to me because he, he used that as an analogy about how um, sometimes our happiness can be dependent on our expectations. And um, sometimes we need to just sit down and think about, you know, are, am I really unhappy because uh, the situation is bad? Or could it be something like being presented with lettuce, which is, it would be the, the analogy of being your favorite thing and um, choosing to stay, stay happy even though you were expecting bananas. If, if I only had to worry about choosing between bananas and lettuce <laughs> as a primate, I would be so happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I know. I just always liked that lecture because it was it was just about or that experiment that Dad uh, would tell because it's just about um having a positive attitude, um, uh, which was which is good. So um. So yeah, the um, and I think that ties into evolution because Dad never fully accepted the idea of evolution, um, but it Despite still being wasn't a quite of science. So, yeah, he he was a doctor and he. But he wasn't so black and white. Like he would say uh -huh. things like, or I don't know if it was him specifically, but there were some attitudes in the family that you know maybe a cat could evolve and a dog could evolve in certain ways, but a cat will still always be a cat and a mm -hmm. dog will still always be a dog. Okay, that's a, um, that's a common argument that I've heard more mainstream Christians make: mm -hmm. um, the idea of there being micro evolution versus macro evolution. Mm -hmm. The problem, though, is, of course, is that with enough micro evolution over a long enough period of time, you get oh, macro. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is what evolution is. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like there is no <laughs> distinction. The difference uh, between the two is the amount of time. Uh -huh. But uh, but I do actually remember having a conversation with Dad. Uh -huh. um, I, I was probably in high school. And he made the point, I don't even know how we started talking about evolution, but he, he, just, he just said, basically, um, we don't know how God created everything. Mm -hmm. um, we have the account in Genesis, but we don't know exactly the specifics of it. Mm -hmm. um, it is possible that evolution was the mechanism that he used. Yes. Um, and Ke Kate would always talk about that. Right. Like... Right. But, but again, that, that only would apply to animals. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't apply to humans. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which that's how i rationalized it exactly mm -hmm. and, and that's how a lot of people do like that that rationale carried me through most of my science classes at byu mm -hmm. you know and then i started asking more questions but anyway go on uh yeah so <laughs> um so this lecture was from uh 2009 and robert sapolsky is uh, a primatologist and he mainly focuses on baboons um and he are they hindus <laughs> um, might be racist. <laughs> and he mentions um, he mentions Jane Goodall, who um, everyone m most people know about her and how mm -hmm. her research on mm -hmm. chimps and how back in the 1960s we used to think that he, th what made humans unique was um, we would make and use tools, but Jane Goodall completely changed that. Point that perspective oh. by saying, by by showing that chimpanzees also use tools. Mm -hmm. So that is not actually what makes us unique. And then he was like, well, what does make us unique? Um, there, it must be something more subtle. And he goes into how humans and animals, we all have the same basic building blocks. We all use the same neurotransmitters and all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but that humans have used them in in unique ways. Um, and he. One of the first points that he makes was he talks about um, these chess players and how they can turn on a massive physiological stress response by and burn um, six to seven thousand calories per day just by sitting and thinking while they play a chess game and that that was the equivalent of a baboon ripping open the stomach of their worst rival. <laughs> 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 and he goes on to say that humans use, um, are using these same basic building blocks like the physiological stress response, but using it in uh, unprecedented ways. And I, okay. al I also wanted to relate that to what I was reading in my book. 
it says that um, traits that evolve by natural selection to serve a particular function can occur later on in contexts that have nothing to do with the original function. So it's not just that humans are using these basic building blocks um, and using them in, in different ways, mm -hmm. but that we're using it in, in to take it into these uncharted territories, uh, and it's specifically intellectually. And then um, he's, he's split up the rest of his lecture in by talking about these domains. And the domains mm -hmm. that he was comparing was aggression, theory of mind, golden rule, empathy, reward, and culture. And there were two of them that I thought were really interesting and um, that I wanted to, to mention here. Um, the first one was aggression, and the second one was reward. Um, so the one about reward is is um, the one that relates specifically to religion. That's why I, I chose the lecture. And the one um, huh. about aggression, I, I liked how it contrasted to his example of the chess players, how we can sit and think quietly while simultaneously burning 7,000 calories per day. And the opposite to, to that would be how there are certain humans who go to work every day and sit quietly in a chair and use a flight simulator to drop bombs in Iraq and kill people on the other side of the world and then at the end of the day go home to their daughter's ballet performance. Um, <laughs> so the idea of instead of burning all these calories and, and turning on this physiological stress response that mm -hmm. we just do these things so nonchalantly mm -hmm. and that these actually can create psych uh, psychiatric problems um, that are also unprecedented. Yeah. Um, so like how you know soldiers have their own version of PTSD now. Yeah. Like, like, like that's the kind of thing that he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then um, moving on to the domain of reward, this was one that I thought was the most interesting relating uh -huh. to religion. Um, so he talks about both how we are not unique and how we are unique. So we are not unique in the sense that we, um, just like um, most other humans, or most other animals, we use the same neurotransmitter, which is dopamine. And mm -hmm. how um, people might think that dopamine is all about reward, where um, they would give, he uses an example with chimpanzees doing an experiment where you give them a signal, then they do the work, and then they get a reward. Okay. Um, and you would think that you would get a dopamine sur surge during the reward. But what actually happens is you re you get a signal, the chimpanzees will get a signal, then they would immediately get have a rise, a spike in dopamine, which causes them to work and mm -hmm. receive a re reward. So dopamine is actually about the anticipation of reward um, uh, or goal-directed behaviors. That's why they were getting mad when the bananas were gone because they worked up all the dopamine over the banana rather than the lettuce. That would, he's getting that? Um... Or am I just Hold on, say reading, that again. reading too much I'm, into I'm it? I'm getting, I'm just, this is just my nervousness. So, so, so joining those two, you, know, you talked about the lettuce mm -hmm. and the banana situation. You had chimpanzees who, were, they would see the banana, they uh -huh. wanted the banana, they had the release of dopamine, so they're getting all worked up about mm -hmm. having the banana. And then when the bananas get taken away, um, and they're giving lettuce, which, you know, objectively they generally like more, uh -huh. um, but the fact that they got all worked up with the dopamine uh -huh. over the banana... And they don't get it. That's what made them angry. Is that? Yeah, I guess it could work that kind way. of be the same, but not real, not as far as like a reward goes, because it wasn't a reward. They're yeah, not having it, oh yeah, to that's do true. They weren't for working the for it or the lettuce. They're but, just being given it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So but it is still, kind of but release. it is still um, the same idea of anticipation. Right. Right. Um, and that actually is interesting because the next thing that he talks about is the idea of introducing maybe how those mm -hmm. chimpanzees didn't end up receiving their banana their bananas, and he says. <clears throat> So he says, um, what happens when you in introduce an unpredictability? Um, so instead of getting the reward 100% of the time, you got the reward 50% of the time. And he said, what happens is you get a, dop uh, a larger dopamine surge. And that when you reduce the unpredictability, like say there's a 25% chance of getting the reward or there's a 75% chance of getting the reward, which are are opposites to each other, mm -hmm. but what they have in common is they reduce the unpredictability, which then lowers the, do the dopamine surge. So, um, if, if you if you tell someone 
that they might get a reward and they they think that it's a 50% chance mm-hmm. that is the the highest anticipation for reward that you can get by studying dopamine. Hmm. 50%? 50%. Huh. So and that, so that's interesting because that's that's exactly what people uh, a lot of religious people say when they bring up Pascal's wager. There's mm-hmm. there's a 50/50 chance. That's, yeah, that's what I'm going to go into. It. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so I'm, okay. So I'm getting a ahead yeah. of the gun. Okay. <laughs> so um, he, he talks about <laughs> first he talks about gambling, saying okay. that um, <clears throat> casinos take use this idea and they want to give the gambler this idea that there's a 50% chance of them winning when it's right. actually much lower than that. <laughs> and the closer they can get to the perception of a 50% winning rate uh-huh. while simultaneously um, manipulating the system so that they're, all, they're winning most of the time, then the casinos win because mm-hmm. they get these gambler's that are addicted to gambling. Right. Mm-hmm. And so while simultaneously losing all their money. Yeah. Which is super sad. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um yeah. Oh, and then so before we move on to, to religion, he he then okay. says, so this is something that is not unique in humans. But what is unique in humans is the lag time between work and reward. Um so the idea that we can work really well in high school to then and raising our GPA to then go on to college and then move on to a career all of this goal directed behavior can be can be seen through like throughout lifetime mm-hmm. um, he says that this also relates to religion like um, you can put the lag time so far out that you can say the rewards not even going to happen until after you die and you'll mm-hmm. still get people to work towards it yeah and you'll still get people to work <laughs> towards it even if the probability is like only 50% chance mm-hmm. Um, and that always makes me think of the, the church hymn, Let Us All Press On in the Work of the Lord, that when life is over, oh. we may gain a reward. Um, and <laughs> going back to the doubts that I had over those past six years, oh. uh, it made me think about how my doubts could have actually been fueling my, my faith and perseverance. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um so as you have more doubts, mm-hmm. your perception of the probability is dropping, thereby mm-hmm. uh, lowering your motivation to work towards this reward. Wait, say that again? So as you have more doubts, mm-hmm. um, your perception of the reward actually happening to you becomes mm-hmm. less and less. Mm-hmm. So you have less uh, motivation to work towards it. Or more motivation. More, yeah. more motivation. Right? Yeah, because if you, if it's, the closer you get it to 50%. So if you think that you're going, like you're, if you're like, okay, I know I'm going to heaven. Uh-huh. It's not, you actually aren't going to be as motivated to work towards that goal um, or to stay in the church as if you had doubts. As if there was a chance that you weren't going to actually make it. You're still, you're going to work harder. I mean, maybe I'm thinking of even further down the road where your doubts keep piling up and piling up and like you... Oh yeah, because so like, it wants you lower it below fifty percent. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's that's what I was getting. At. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So I I was just th- that just made me start thinking about doubt. Um, as, so so as, you're saying that if you have the probability where you think that it's a hundred percent chance, then mm-hmm. that makes you even less motivated to work. Yeah, but you're still it, it would still make you committed because uh-huh. you would believe it. But if you start having doubts, then the doubts could actually be used to keep you in the church. Sort of like how you... That's, when, m- that's at least my own commentary on Right. So, so sort of like with your example, with you, mm-hmm. when you started having doubts, um, your probability started to drop, um, but I'm, I'm assuming you didn't break lower than 50%, figuratively speaking, mm-hmm. and so you doubled down instead. Like you got mm-hmm. more committed to like work towards it. Yeah. So 50% is like the optimum... Mm-hmm. For goal for goal directed behavior. Okay, okay, I think we're on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the church can basically make you feel insecure, and then you use that insecurity to then cling to the church. Okay. So for me, um, like thinking about this as an ex Mormon, I was thinking about my my doubts of like as doubts as in whether or not the church is true. Mm-hmm. Or is there a heaven or a reward? But then there can also be doubts as a true believer, doubting your worthiness to get into heaven. Like you might believe in heaven, but oh. are you worthy? Um, yeah. And then you can also combine those two ideas um, 
if you were start doubting your faith like I was, but then I turned that around and started using my 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 weak testimony to then doubt my worthiness. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the two are linked. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All this is pretty heavy. It, it sounds kind of depressing. It's like a it's like a mind job. It's mm-hmm. like they're using complex psychology tricks to, you know, manipulate people into belief right. and yeah. to like Well, and the church is really good at that. At mm-hmm. sowing the seeds of doubt in an individual person, uh-huh. which then brings yeah. that, like makes them like recommit to everything. I remember that happening to me quite a few times yeah. growing up. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and the other point that the uh, that this made me think of is the idea that this doesn't always have to be a, a conscious effort on the part of the church. Like the church can still be genuine and uh, not trying to fuel your mm-hmm. doubts in order to to uh, like keep you in. And, it's a more natural um, phenomenon. And yeah, and okay. one one thought that I had was is thinking about religion from the perspective of natural selection is um, I think I might have read this by Dawkins once or he at least had this idea of natural selection of religion Mm -hmm. and how it doesn't have to be a conscious thing just like how evolution of animals is not conscious thing Mm -hmm. Um, uh, this example has to do with um, reproduction so you could have two groups one group says that you that God is telling you to multiply and replenish the earth and the other group is saying that you shouldn't reproduce at all and sex is bad and sinful even in the context of having children and you ask yourself which one is going to to last which religion is going to grow Mm -hmm. and that um it's the one that makes the most babies yes the one that makes (laughs) the most babies because it's more sustainable yep Mm -hmm. and that has nothing to do with morals has everything you, to do with the, the the promulgating of the religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then I started thinking about religion uh, as far as it how it can evolve alongside society. So th- yeah, that's an interesting point. Like the the idea that um, you know religion is kind of a, a natural phenomenon that um, people cling to. They they have the sense of community. They've got different uh, you know psychological and social pressures. Um, promise of a reward like it might happen so they work mm-hmm. towards it like yeah like in the context of natural selection that all makes a whole lot of sense you know uh-huh. why that would draw a lot of people a lot of more people in and it would keep it more close-knit um it certainly ties in really nicely with the uh you know the concept of tribalism of more primitive mm-hmm. humans um yeah interesting yeah um so yeah just talking about um doubt and faith and a few scriptures came to mind and one of them was the one that joseph smith always uses which is james 1 5. Okay. Uh, if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of god that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given you be given him mm-hmm. um, which is a, a scripture that people in the church love to talk about mm-hmm. like it comes up all the time yeah because that was um yeah that was basically the scripture that joseph smith um, use personally in his personal endeavors to hmm. to decide what church to join, which he eventually decided to make up his own church. Um, and the other example was Moroni's promise um, in the the at the end of the Book of Mormon. Mm-hmm. Um, it Moroni so it was the last person to write in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, the last prophet. And he basically ends um, the Book of Mormon by saying. And in, on Moroni 10, 4 through 5, it says, And when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that ye would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if ye shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, ye may know the truth of all things. So that just, again, goes back into the idea of faith and doubt and how... Um, if you don't, re- if you pray and you don't receive an answer, it makes you feel like it's your fault. Yeah, mm-hmm. and Double it just causes more again. doubt. Yep. yep, blame the victim. Mm-hmm. Yep. So now to the book that I'm reading, Games Primates Play. the The main theme that I found from the, this book um, that kept being repeated over and over they they did a, a chapter on it at the very beginning and then they just kept reiterating it throughout the rest of the book is this idea of dominance versus submission and how this is like a very mm. primate quality in humans mm-hmm. 
and yeah. how dominance from an evolutionary point of view is used as a tool for conflict re resolution and it decreases arguments um it certainly makes governing a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> but then it, it, it talks about, like, you know, but what about, like, relationships and stuff? Mm -hmm. um, and how uh, if you have a relationship where one person is being overly dominant or abusive to the, uh, to the other person, um, obviously that's not a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. But so it, ma it makes you um, think about, like, you know, if... If you see a couple who never argues, does that mean that that's a healthy relationship, or does it mean that there is uh, a dominant, dominant so abusive relationship, mm -hmm. like dominance versus submission? Right, which is, which is interesting because that's the sort of thing that, at least you know, more traditional forms of Christianity and, and I guess other religions as well, um, Islam would probably fit in this as well. Um, like the, they would, their dynamic is within you know a marriage is the man is the head of the household mm -hmm. he runs everything and the wife is supposed to be submissive to him you know so i mean it sounds like that just lines up perfectly yeah and well even in religion like followers are supposed to be humble meek and submissive like right and then yeah. god the is supposed to be and, the dominant yeah. one yeah and that's that's immediately as i was reading the book there was um uh, there was this scripture that kept popping into my head um, which is a Mormon mm -hmm. scripture mastery scripture, which I'll, I'll go ahead and read. It's Mosiah 319. It says, For the natural man is an enemy of God and has been from the fall of Adam <laughs> and will be forever and ever unless he yields to the, to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth, putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth. Which I just found that to be, after while I was reading this book, it it was like so blatantly hip, hypocritical oh. in the sense that they they were saying that we need to rise above the natural man, um, but in order to do that, we need to then submit to right the our primate God. Well, the the, <laughs> the thing that that strikes me about this is within Mormonism, um, there's the doctrine of people um, getting into heaven and then essentially becoming gods and ruling their own universes mm -hmm. or planets or whatever. Um, and the the road to godhood, mm -hmm. apparently, is being meek and submissive and following orders. Right. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you and, get to rule everything. And then you get to rule everything? <laughs> how does that work? How does, how does being mm -hmm. submissive and just following... Um, you know, the orders of somebody above you, how does that prepare you to be mm -hmm. the ultimate supreme leader of everything? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> that doesn't make a lick of sense to me. <laughs> and the book that I was reading said uh, that humans and, and some other primates are obsessed with domination, although not necessarily at a conscious level. Mm -hmm. And I just think that it, the church is just um, being abusive and manipulative. Uh -huh. And it kind of made me think of God as being like the great ape in the sky. <laughs> Good picture. That, that I think is the title of this episode The Great Ape in the Sky. <laughs> um, that's funny. From the Mormon perspective, the natural man, again, because religion uh, um, doesn't always acknowledge evolution, so they're not actually mm -hmm. talking about this from like uh, humans or primates. They actually mean the natural man as in. Um, someone who is without the Holy Spirit. Huh. But it's okay. still, but I still think that it, that it relates because they, they talk about um, it, um, the idea that all people are carnal or mo mortal because of the fall of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. um, but it's through spirituality and submitting to, to God that um, we can rise above the natural man. Which... Yeah. It's, it's just funny because... I mean, as you're pointing out, like this is a, a totally natural phenomenon that happens within humanity, mm -hmm. and they're trying to make it sound like it's the like supernatural. It's, like thing. you're rising above, right? It's like the, our animal instincts. Exactly, and you're rising above animal instincts to become this most natural thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, and just reading the book, it make, makes me feel like this is actually like one of the strongest animal urges that we have as humans. And primates and animals. Well, the urge for believing in religion or following religion. Or just religion. the urge dominance. for dominance, dominance. versus okay. submission. Okay. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting about this book was that how they said that this this urge 
to um, be submissive or, or dominating is so strong in our human nature that is they actually believe it is impossible to eliminate and that it is involved in every interaction that we have with humans and that even if we don't realize it at a conscious level, mm. every relationship we have, there is this dominant versus submissive quality well, yeah, to I mean, it. It's, it's like the most natural thing in the world when you think mm. about it because you have all of these hierarchies. You have student-teacher relationships. You have uh, workers and their bosses. You have you know all the hierarchies in between, you know, seventh graders versus eighth graders. Yeah. It's like, like any interaction that you have is going to have that kind of d- dynamic at least a little bit. Mm-hmm. Even you with know? your own siblings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like this. Yeah, it just sounds like the most natural thing in the world. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, the, this book has been interesting. I'm not quite finished with it yet. Um, mm-hmm. Getting there. Um, but as I was reading the book, I kept referring back to the lecture with Robert Sapolsky um, because I felt like they, the two went hand in hand with each other. Mm-hmm. And what I found was interesting because the thing that originally drew me to the lecture was talking about re- reward and dopamine. But I, it was interesting to me to rewatch it a few years later. Um, and notice the way that he chose to end the lecture, um, and this is him speaking as an atheist. Okay. And it actually, it made me wonder if, if he was actually at this point still speaking as a primatologist or if he was speaking more as a motivational speaker. Mm. Because he says that the most defining thing about humans that makes us the most unique is the idea that the less it is possible that something can be, the more that it must be. He says, at the end of the day, it's really impossible for one person to make a difference, and thus, the more clearly, absolutely, utterly, irrevocably, unchangeably clear that it is impossible to to make a difference and make the world better, the more you must. Did I actually quote that correctly? I think I may have misstated that. Did that make sense? I think that made sense. Do you understand it? I, I got yeah, kind of so lost. At the end of the day, it's really impossible for one person to make a difference, and thus the, the more clearly, absolutely, utterly, irrevocably, unchangeably clear it is that it is impossible to make a difference and to make the world better, the more you must. Oh, okay. And then he started going into Christianity, and he quoted this guy named Kierkegaard, who I'm not very familiar with, but he's Sounds apparently a familiar. Christian philosopher. Um and the, the quote that he said was that Christian faith requires that faith persists in the face of the impossible and that humans have the capacity to simultaneously believe in two contradic- contradictory things. Mm. Which for me... <laughs> oh, I think it's more than two. <laughs> uh, was kind of confusing for me. But I liked how it tied into the, the idea that, that when it comes to dominance and submission... The book states that it's impossible to eliminate, mm-hmm. um, and it made me think, you know, how Robert Sapolsky was talking about this idea of rising above, and I think that religion is all, all talking about rising above this, these human instincts, and to become better than it. So you have a, a way of doing that? Well, his example, he used a Christian example. Let me see, I have it here. He used an example of a Catholic nun, nun who was ministering to death row inmates. And she said, um, her quote was, the less forgivable the act, the more it must be forgiven. The less lovable a person is, the more you must find the means to love them. Which for me, I I still, I liked the idea of, uh-huh. of being able to, to rise above our human instincts. And I found that to be very inspirational. But when I was reading the quote that he said about how this is all about simultaneously believing in two contradictory things. My mind immediately went to the idea of cognitive dissonance, and I always right. think of that as being a very negative thing that I was always fighting against. Mm-hmm. So I went online to try to like just get some more commentary on this because I, I have some mixed feelings about it. Okay. Um, so I went back online um, to try to look up this quote, this quote by Kirkgaard. Okay. Um, and I just came across Sapolsky again, but it was from this blogger who had apparently listened to um, the same lecture, but, um, oh, I should have also introduced the lecture. Like the name of it? Well, the, lec- the name of it is um, The Uniqueness of Humans. Okay. And he was speaking to... And this to, is available on YouTube? Yeah, this is available on okay, YouTube. Cool. Um, and he was speaking to... 
an audience in Stanford. I think it was like a graduation um, ceremony that he was speaking at. Okay. And this, but this blogger heard the same lecture, um, but it wasn't the same video. It was a different. It was a different lecture, lecture that he gave that was titled "Humans Are We Just Another Primate?" But it was basically the same thing. Oh. He went over all the same points. But I did notice one thing at the very end when he was talking about our uniqueness and not just how it's unique that it, the, the less possible it is that something can be, the more it must be. But he also talked about how unique it is for humans to have this power of abstraction. Like being able to conceptualize things, like abstract yeah, comments. Yeah, um, and to like just like process things um, you, by using symbols and metaphors and analogies. Okay. Um, and some examples that he gave was, was the fact that, um, our, that our insular cortex, um, which can activate when we smell something can, disgusting, can also be activated when we hear something that is morally disgusting. And okay, so this would tie in with, like, say, uh, psychological conditioning. Yeah. Okay. Um, which is something that I've tied in with religion for a long time. It's like mm -hmm. the compulsion that a lot of people have when they hear a swear word. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they've conditioned themselves to react negatively to, you know, the F word or whatever. And, and so whenever they hear that, they feel bad. They have a negative emotion mm -hmm. reaction to it. And they tell themselves in their mind that it's not an emotion. At least Mormons, like the spin that they use, is that's not an emotion. That's the spirit of God leaving you yeah. mm -hmm. because you heard something bad. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So it sounds like it's, yeah, the same kind of thing. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's just interesting to think about how we process abstract thoughts in kind of a literal sense. And in, in in, when you think about it by like our brain processes and how we can act, be activating the same things, whether it's literal or figuratively. Mm hmm. Um, like, like when you hold a warm coffee, mm. if you're having a conversation with someone while you're holding oh, but, the warm but coffee. But a good Mormon wouldn't hold it, oh, a warm true. coffee. Sorry. A warm hot chocolate. <laughs> when, you, when you have some hot chocolate, then you will perceive the person who you're talking with as being warmer. Mm -hmm. oh. um, or if you drink a cold drink, you will perceive that person as being colder. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so, and that made me think about the idea of Jesus and how he uses parables and analogies to and and to t kind of turn religion into this abstract um idea uh, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, eliciting certain kinds of emotions by mm -hmm. giving using, certain kinds of metaphors and parables yeah, and using abstraction no oh. um and my thoughts i guess as i'm still reading this book i haven't finished it but just been thinking about this for the past few weeks um my idea was the uh, was the thought that by rising we can rise above the natural man by turning Jesus into an abstraction. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I kind of got this idea from when I was in high school. My my high school English teacher kept t talking to us about this idea that the, there was this German word um, that's pronounced Gestalt. That he kept talking about and it's the okay. just the idea that of thinking about an object as an idea so like a horse a horse is a horse whether or not yeah <laughs> <laughs> whether or not the the so like if the, the a horse is a real live animal uh -huh. um, but if a horse in the future becomes extinct the the gestalt of a horse or the idea of a horse uh -huh still stays the same and that you can talk about yeah. a horse in the sense of an idea and you can talk about a unicorn in the sense of an idea I'm just gonna say it doesn't like, matter if it's real or not creatures yeah too yeah uh, and so for me i just feel like you know using the this idea of discussing jesus as a concept mm -hmm. um and i feel like religion is kind of going that way in general people are taking it's religion wishy -washy. less literally mm -hmm. Using more analogies. God is more of a good idea mm -hmm. than a father figure. <laughs> yeah. No, I can um, see that, yeah. Yeah. And then just the, the idea that ultimately I think that everyone is wanting the same things. We all want to be good people. We all want world peace, um, but that we just might have different methods or different ideas for well, getting there. World peace and 
harsher uh, <laughs> punishments for parole yeah, violators. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> That's from the Scooby Doo. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there are people that will laugh at that. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. That was how I was going to end. So, yeah. Rising so above. lots of... Uh, Rise above human nature. Yeah, lots of uh, psychology going mm-hmm. on. All right, good stuff. Um, any final thoughts on the games primates play? I'll have to look it up. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot of stuff to think about. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot deeper than we're used to on this podcast. Yeah. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> and again, we're I'm still, still reading infancy. the book, so a lot yeah. of these are very fresh, and I'm... Yeah. I kind of feel like I'm rambling in some places. And I, some I feel like I should thoughts. make more comments, but I, I'm just kind of processing and mulling <laughs> it over. It's like there's just so much going on. All right, cool. Um, all right, so I have a couple of articles. Um, we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on them, but given that we've been talking a lot about Mormonism lately, and I don't want that to necessarily be the only thing that we talk about, um, I wanted to talk about some other things. Um, so I have an article... Um, let me see. This is from the LA Times.com. Um, the headline is Indian trucker, Indian is in from India, was killed over rumor that he was carrying beef. Oh my gosh. Okay, was so this in India? This is in India. Okay. Okay, so in India, there's this, this man. Um, he's an 18 year old um, man who, who drives a truck in India and. He was carrying coal in his truck, and there was a rumor going around that he was actually transporting beef, which was a is it's a big no no in Hindu communities because cows are sacred, and they have all of these prohibitions about what you can and can't do, and and their prohibitions apparently um, extend not just to Hindus, but like these are like nationwide policies that you you know can't do certain things to cows uh, because it offends hindus so this man um there there was this rumor going around that he was transporting beef so some a group of i think it was like five or six men um tracked him down found out where he was driving his truck and then threw uh gasoline bombs at his truck lit it on fire and burned him alive and he's carrying coal and he's carrying coal (laughs) right so so the man's dead Mm -hmm. um you know, terrible, horrific stuff, right? Um, there, there turned out, um, like after this happened, there was kind of a public outcry. Um, there was a, a few thousand people in the neighborhood who got together to do a counter protest, basically just kind of saying that this is a horrific event. We don't condone killing people for violating, you know, these rules and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I guess that's the, the, the positive takeaway is that this is a terrorist group. This is this group of uh, you know, a handful of men who went out and killed this one man on a rumor. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, most of the people there um, don't do that kind of thing. Don't condone right. that kind of thing. Which Just vigilantes. Vi- yeah, there's, there's, there's uh, vigilantism, which kind of ties into a lot of the talk that's been going on about the Muslim community, extremism, fundamentalism. Um, you and I, Corinne, have talked a lot about, you know, the refugee situation going on, um, which I don't necessarily want to get into right now because i mean that that could take forever Mm -hmm. um getting into that but you know the the idea that not all muslims are terrorists not all hindus will kill you if you eat beef um i I mean it's kind of important concept but that being said not everybody being a terrorist um this is not the first time this has happened in india okay this article just in this article um it says that there has been within the last few weeks um, another uh, politician who was attacked, um, he, he allegedly had beef served at a dinner or some kind of luncheon, and a terrorist group um, tracked him down and uh, threw bottles of ink at him, like covered him in ink, as like a counter-protest to him eating beef at a party. So like PETA throwing red paint on Essentially. people wearing fur coats? Yeah. Um, and then there was another person who also um there was another rumor that they were eating beef and he was killed this was in a, another city um and i think this other person yeah he it says down here at the very bottom that this man wasn't even hindu he was a muslim who was allegedly eating beef mm. okay so so yeah so not everybody's a terrorist true mm-hmm. not everybody's bad true mm-hmm. 
but it's still a problem. Right. Yeah. And it's still something that, that needs to be addressed. It still needs to be um, fixed. Like, we need to have better policies. This being in India, I mean, India's good grief. There's yeah. so many problems politically and socially in India. Um, I can't even imagine where they would even start. But in the United States, like, this is something that comes up all the time. You know, but I don't know. I, I don't know if that there is a clear answer or what could really be done other than just having in place, you know, don't kill people. <laughs> Which is in place. Which is in place, I suppose. But uh, I don't know. Any any thoughts? Nope. That's just crazy. Yeah, that sounds very crazy. Yeah, just, just crazy, <laughs> crazy stuff in India. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so that's the one thing that uh, I wanted to bring up that wasn't just Mormon related. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of ironic that I've said that because the last thing that I wanted to end up end on um, being the most positive thing that we'll be talking about today probably mm-hmm. um, <laughs> it's an article from uh, zelfontheshelf.com which is a, a great little blog um, uh, it, it's called A Celestial Coffee Guide The Most Apostate Way to Help LGBTs <laughs> <laughs> so this is Mormon themed coffee okay. um so yeah, going back to the whole talking about Mormons, even though I said we weren't going to only talk about Mormons. Anyway, so Mormons don't drink coffee. It's part of uh, their charter, so to speak. It's um, their version of the Word of Wisdom. Right. They, they call it the Word of Wisdom. It's their dietary code. And so for a lot of people, when they leave Mormonism, um, it becomes this big deal that they have their first cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. And, and Utah has kind of, um, it's been kind of marketing towards ex-Mormons a little bit more lately, it seems. Um, and this coffee company, uh, what's it called? Celestial Blend Coffee. They have a website, www.celestialblendcoffee.com. Um, they've been doing a promotional thing where they are giving uh, a 10% discount to people that have you know, ties with this particular blog and they're doing things of, for, you know, raising money for LGBT um, individuals that are in need, um, which is all great. It's great stuff. You should definitely check it out. But the reason that I love this is because they're, the names that they have for their coffee are all Mormon related. Mm-hmm. And I find that hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just kind of go through it. Um, so the first one that they have on the list is called a cup of Joe, which is funny because <laughs> of Joseph Smith. <laughs> and uh, so, so they have uh, different ratings. They have roast as, as one category. Uh, sin intensity mm-hmm. is another category, playing on the whole idea that drinking coffee is a sin in Mormonism. And then they have a, a description of the flavor. Okay, So cup o Joe from Celestial Blend. The roast is light. As in, I saw a pillar of. (laughs) (laughs) Playing into Uh the idea that Joseph Smith claimed to see a pillar of light and then he saw God uh, in the the first vision. Mm -hmm. Um, The sin intensity, levity, or boyish treasure hunting. Mm -hmm. Oh. (laughs) Yeah, so Joseph famously was a treasure hunter before he Mm -hmm. found the gold plates, which... Although it's not famous in Mormon circles. That's true. That's one of those things that gets brushed under the rug a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so people that are in the know will find that funny. <laughs> um, and the flavor, smooth like a cult leader, light like the skin of a Nephite, an endearing nuttiness like Martin Harris, earthy but not of the earth, hints of herb to jive with the word of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the, the second one uh, is called Father, Son, and Holy Roast. <laughs> uh, the roast is described as medium. See also oracle, witch, or necromancer. Uh, sin intensity, polyandry. The flavor is smooth as a bishop's shave and sweet like an underage wife. <laughs> for for an experience so divine, you'll think you're in the sacred grove. <laughs> okay, uh, the next one is called Brigham's Buzz, 
Brigham being Brigham Young, the second uh, president of the church. Um, the roast is so dark it couldn't get the priesthood. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, which is funny because Mormons traditionally, uh, you know, up until 1978, blacks couldn't get the priesthood in the Mormon church, mm -hmm. um, which is a really funny line in the, the play, the Broadway play, The Book of Mormon. Um, God changed his mind in 1978 about black people. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Sin intensity, blood atonement. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Bringing it back full circle. The flavor is rich as a mission president full-bodied as nephi the smoky tone <laughs> the smoky tone comes from the souls of apostates burning in hell as nutty as adam god doctrine and as spicy as eliza r snow's love life eliza r snow being um one of joseph smith's poly polygamous wives who actually signed one of the affidavits that we were talking about at the mm -hmm. beginning claiming that Joseph Smith okay. didn't practice polygamy mm -hmm. when at the, t the time she was one of his wives. Mm -hmm. So that's fun. Um, let's see. I, I think that's all of the different types. Um, and then they give um, instructions for how you can donate to their LGBT cause. Um, so again, great stuff. Mm -hmm. Good things. Yeah. I support it. Um, <laughs> maybe someday I'll actually buy some other stuff. Just to check it out. I, I just wanted to end on a happy note. <laughs> well great um thanks megan for coming yeah thank it you was very interesting we talked about tons of things good yeah. yeah so good good stuff <laughs> well that's our show thanks everyone for listening <laughs> <laughs> um if you would like to contact us you can do so by emailing us at circle squared podcast at gmail.com or you can check out the show's blog at www.circlesquaredpodcast.blogspot.com. And we will catch you next time at the Circle Squared Podcast. Bye. <laughs>